Hey, we're back. Maybe, hopefully, is the hopefully the audio is a little bit better here. Let's uh, give just a moment here for some people to jump on. I kind of had to do this just a little bit uh, differently at the last minute because that audio was just not good, man. Um, man, it just seems like <clears throat> it's live now, man. It seems like it is just the enemy is just fighting us left and right. You know, it just seems like it would be. Uh, let's give it just a second here. Hey, we're getting some people back on now. Um, are we live now? Is that audio? Is the, I'm hoping this audio is a little bit better. Sounds better. Is Good deal. Now? All right. Well, I'm not going to be able to... Uh, uh, I I'm not going to be able to see your comments on here. Well, maybe I will. Yep. So if you would, just... Uh, moment share this video man it's terrible we had we had a good group of people on the other video already but uh you know it is what it is it is what it is so we're gonna get uh going here and just <clears throat> let me get going here in just a second but i'll tell you what i am i'm ex i'm excited to be with you this evening i'm excited to uh just see what's going just to see what's going to happen. I'm just believing that I'm believing that through these video messages that uh, I just pray God is ministering to you. And I believe that uh, anything we do to help get the word out there is a um, is a glorious thing is a great thing. And I am just I am pumped. I'm excited. And we're going to jump in this thing tonight. I don't want to I always hate those videos where you got to spend five minutes of Wait, we're going to wait, we're going to wait, we're going to wait. Just get to the point. So we're just going to get to the point tonight. So let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we thank you for this evening. God, we pray right now, Father God, that you would just have your way, that you would watch over us, that you would be with us, and that you would keep us, and that God, everything would just, uh, that you would just have your way. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. So this evening, I want to talk to you about um, not just a, a subject, but a person, a person in the Bible that, um, there's any of them, but there's a few people that you can find in the old Testament and the new Testament, you know, an example of that would be Moses. You know, we saw Moses in the old Testament. We saw Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration or, you know, same thing with Elijah. We saw Elijah in the old Testament doing his prophet business. And then we also see Elijah in the new Testament on the Mount of Transfiguration as well. And then, of course, you, you, could, you, could, you could totally make the argument for Jesus being in the Old Testament as well, you know, as a, as a theophany. And uh, we don't have, which a theophany is a big, fancy, intellectual word that just means Jesus, just means Jesus in the Old Testament, pretty much is what that means. So um, tonight, if you got your Bibles, we are going to go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter two, and I am going to talk to you tonight about um, just what I think is going on in the world, what I think is uh, happening, uh, and and I think part of the reason that we're having so many issues with everything that's been working pretty well for the last few weeks, and now all of a sudden, you know, um, things are going weird and things are going crazy. Because I think the enemy doesn't want this message to get out, and I think that um, by doing this, we are going to start enabling. Uh, <clears throat> We're going to start enabling the church, enabling believers, enabling all of you, those of you that are partnered with me, partnered with our ministry to be able to pray effectively, to move into everything that God has for us. And I'll tell you what, I am excited. I tell you, I'm excited. God is going to do not 
and I'm going to correct myself because I have this bad habit of God is going to, God is going to. And I don't, I don't like that. I don't like to say God is going to because God is already moving. God is already doing things. God is already saving people. He is setting people free. We're seeing people delivered. We're seeing people come into baptism. We're seeing people grow in their faith. And, and it's not just, you know, here at our church and our ministry, we're not seeing it in great numbers yet, but I'm believing I'm believing in faith that we're going to see great and mighty things happen. We're going to see great and powerful things happen. Uh, and I'm just, I, 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 I could go on and on and on about that. But in the midst of God moving, in the midst of everything happening, there's still this, this undercurrent in the world that, we want to, we've got to talk about the power of Jezebel and the power Jezebel is one of those old Testament figures that, uh, you don't really want to be around. It was, a, she is an example of mischievousness and she is an example of, uh, just everything anti God. You, you know, you could, you could make an argument. I'm not, I'm not saying this, but you could make the argument that Jezebel is part of an anti Christ spirit. He, she is <clears throat> because a, a Jezebel spirit is anti the will of God. So what is Jezebel? Who is Jezebel? Jezebel, old Testament queen. She was the queen. She was a queen uh, of one of the kingdoms around Israel, and I can't remember which one. Just right off the top of my head, if you know it, put it in the comments. But she was she was a princess of one of the, uh, I believe it was Syria. And I, I could be I could be wrong, so don't quote me on that. Maybe I might be wrong. Maybe, but it's uh, you can go look it up for yourself. And uh, like I said, if you know the answer to that, leave it in the comments. But she was this queen or this princess, and she married King Ahab. Now, King Ahab had the privilege, I guess you would say. I don't know about privilege, but he had the notoriety of being the most, the first and the worst king of Israel. Not the first king, but he was definitely the worst king of Israel. He, uh, he is noted with taking more leading more people away from the principles and the path and the law of Moses that God had set out for them. And we still got a problem with the, do we still got a problem with the audio? I just got a message about the audio. What is going on tonight? Hello, hello, hello. Are we doing okay? Can I? Hello, hello, hello. All right, so what I'm hearing on my end sounds okay. Um, okay. I got a couple messages. The audio is sounding okay on their end. Um, I don't know. Oh man, I don't know what's going on. It's just, it's man. Tell you what, <clears throat> it's just, I don't know, man, all messed up now. Okay. Anyways, let's get back into this. So Jezebel is one of those people that, um, she is just, she is all over the place. She is all over. She is all about, um, taking people away from, the presence of God away from the spirit of God and leading them off into idolatry. Now in revelation two verse 20, it says this, it says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality to eat things sacrificed to idols, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent. 
I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and I will give each one of you according to your works. So let's take a look at Jezebel because she started in the Old Testament, but we find her and she ends up in the book of Revelation and in not in, in, in the book of Revelation and not in a good way. Now, the first thing in verse 20, it says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow. Now, that word allow could also be translated as tolerate. I have a few things against you because you tolerate that woman. Or another translation says your wife, meaning that you, meaning that that church had married into the idea and the philosophies of Jezebel. And what are those what are those ideas and those philosophies? The first thing is that to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. You see, Jezebel is all about taking and perverting what God intended to be a certain way. And Human sexuality is one of those things that if we believe, I believe that it is between a man and a woman, one man, one woman. And it's, it's so, so not, not polygamy um, and, and not anything like that, that it is between one man and one woman, which means that any deviation from what God set in order at the beginning is sexual immorality. Now, I know that there, I know that we live in a day and we live in an age and we live in a culture where um, we say that, where we don't, I don't say it, but many people say that it's, it's okay. God created me this way. God created me a certain way. And the problem is, and, and there's the, the problem with that logic is that, um, God doesn't do that. God doesn't create us, you know? So what we would say then is that there's, there's a deception being strewn about. There is this deception. There's this deceiving spirit. And I would think it was Jezebel and there may be a few others, but there is this deceit, this idea of deception that is coming in and it is making people see things that are bad and seeing them as good. And Matthew 24, Jesus talks about in the end times, people won't tolerate sound doctrine. And, you know, and, and I know that there, there, there are so many arguments and that's not, that's not the intent and that's not the heart of tonight's lesson. Is, and I'm not, I'm not going down that road any further tonight, but we have to be very, very careful. And we have to, as Christian believers, now listen, if you are not a Christian believer, you don't have to agree with me. Um, it's just the bottom line is because because I'm talking to Christians right now in this instance, and I am talking to people who claim faith in the belief, claim faith in G, as G, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And what we have to understand is that what Jezebel wants to do is she wants to come in and she wants to pervert the idea of our sexuality. She wants to, and, and it's not just homosexual or trans or anything. It's not, I'm not trying to beat up on that. It's also heterosexual sins. It's heterosexual. Um, it's, it's, it's adultery. It's lust. It's fornication. It's uh, greed and all of these other things that go into it. But we live in a culture and we live in a day and an age where everybody wants to say that everything is okay. And we, and that's what this spirit wants us to believe is that the, everything is okay and nothing is wrong. And as long as you, as long as you love God, you love Jesus, you do this, then everything will be okay. You'll be all right. And, uh, you know, just say a prayer at the end and God's a merciful God. Now God is a merciful God and God is a God of grace and, and he does extend mercy and grace, but we cannot abuse. We cannot, Paul, Paul says in Romans, should we keep on sinning so that grace may abound? Absolutely not. No, we, we cannot stop. We must not continue 
knowingly and willingly in sin. We must stop, we must refrain, we must change the way we think, which is the Greek word metanoia, which means to repent, to repent, to change the way we think and go in another direction. We have to. And if we don't, we are coming into agreement with a lie and we are doing the same thing that Eve did in the garden, coming into agreement with a lie. So that's the first thing is that she is that she teaches and seduces my servants to commit sexual immorality. Now, here's the thing. She teaches it. What are our children being taught in schools? What, what are the, you, you, you see the agenda in, in the news. You see all of these things, this, this liberal ideology that's coming in and wants to teach and rehash and rechange and redo things um, with our children in the midst of and I want to teach them that it's okay to, you know, a six-year-old does not need to be, a six-year-old doesn't need to be going to a story time learning about sexual things. I'm sorry, that should be for their parents to do and for people to do um, as they see fit in their own home. But we shouldn't be seeing this in the public square. We shouldn't be seeing these things come out. And honestly, church members, it's time for us to stand up and take a stand and say, no, this is wrong. This is immoral. And this needs to stop because we're training the net. We're tr allowing people to train a generation in the way they should go. And the, 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 the scripture says that if you train a child in the way that they should go when they depart or when they get old, they won't depart from it. But the same thing goes if we train them in wickedness, they won't depart from it. So there has to be a remnant of believers that stands up and says, we're going to stand for righteousness and we're going to teach our children and our posterity and we're going to get active in a community and we're going to start doing some things to make sure that we're reaching the people, we're reaching this next generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ and not just sitting at home on our laurels waiting for Jesus to, waiting for Gabriel to blow the trumpet and the, and, and for all of the sinners to go to hell and us to go to heaven. I mean, there, we have got to get on the ball about changing and doing some things or I, I just don't even think we should call ourselves Christians. I think we should just go home, pack up our stuff and quit doing it. If, if we're not going to make a stand for righteousness and we're not going to make a, uh, and we're not going to start moving into the things that we need to move into as a body of believers, as a church, as a I mean, I'm, I'm talking to any body of believers that's on there. Apply that to your own church. We, you have got, we have got to start standing up against these things in our culture or, or we're going to lose the culture. We're going to lose people. And it's not a good thing, church. It's not a good thing. Okay. <clears throat> So the next thing he goes on to say is he says, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. What are things that are sacrificed to idols? Now, Paul goes into, Paul goes into great lengths to talk about how um, we're free to do. And, and if you eat meat sacrificed to idols, you're not going to go to hell. But here, I, th I believe what the writer is talking about, I believe what Jesus is trying to communicate is that they are living dual personalities. They are going to church on Sunday, but yet they are still living this life of, uh, they're still living this life that, uh, this other life, you know, and, and they're, they're, they're living split. They're living uh, in duality. They're living in mixture. And the Bible has a lot to say about living in mixture and how that we cannot live in, we, we cannot live in mixture. You know, he goes on to say in Revelation here that you either be hot or cold, but if you're mixed, if you are lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And I think that's exactly what Jezebel is doing here to this church in Revelation verse uh, 2 verse 20 is that she is causing them to eat eat things sacrificed to idols. She is causing them to go into the temple and to partake of these feasts and to do the things and worship God and and do just a little bit extra. You know, 
And so we, we've got to be very careful about making sure that we are not being lulled into a sense of, uh, lulled into a sense of security in, in, anything that we are doing and we have to make sure we have to stand up and we have to make sure that we are standing for righteousness that we are standing for holiness that we are standing for all of these things put together and in that you know we can't just sit down and go oh my the world's going to hell in a handbasket we just can't we have to stand up and we have to say okay one, I'm going to make sure that I am not living in mixture, that I'm going to make sure that I am not living uh, in sin. With no, And what I'm talking about when I say living in sin, I'm talking about living in known, active, you're doing it, you know it's wrong, yet you still think you're right with God. And we have to we have to grow to a place to where we discipline ourselves and say, no, this is sin. And I am not going to participate with darkness because first John tells us that you are either in the light or you are in the darkness. There cannot be no mixture. Light light shines forth in darkness and destroys the darkness. So you are either in light or you are in darkness and there 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 cannot be any middle ground. And so we have to make we have to make this decision of are we going to live in the light as he is in the light or are we going to live in darkness as he is are we are we just going to live in darkness as the other he lives in the darkness and breathes in the darkness and in the dark and we have got to take the searchlight of God we've got to shine it on our hearts we've got to shine it on our souls we've got to shine it on our home lives we've got to shine it on the programs that we're watching we've got to shine it on the things that we do how we manage our time and we have got to make sure that what we are doing lines up with scripture what we are thinking what we are praying what we are believing in lines up with scripture or I'm afraid we are bowing down to idols we are worshiping God on Sunday and we're bowing down to idols Monday through Saturday and so we have to be very, very careful and very, very intentional about what we do, how we do it, and why we're doing it. Because verse 22 gives us a very dire warning. It says that, indeed, I will cast her, her being Jezebel, into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. You see, we cannot live in fellowship with, we cannot live in fellowship with darkness and reap the rewards of being in the light. Come on, that's so, that's that's good right there. You that, That's so good, I'm going to repeat it again. You cannot live in darkness and expect to find, expect to have the blessings of being in the light. And, and I Christians today, so many believers today have that expectation that they, they can live however they want to and still receive the blessings of God and still live and, and be okay. And the, the bottom line of it is, is we cannot do that. We cannot live in mixture. We cannot live in idolatry. We have to make sure, we have to check our hearts. We have to make sure that we are not bowing down to the idols of the culture and bowing down to the idols of our workplace and bowing down to the idols of, of social media and television and the just everything that surrounds us on a daily basis. We've got to make sure that we are still a wholly separate people that is set apart to do the works of God, to set apart to show, to shine forth in glory on the earth. And we've got to make sure that our lives look different as born again, Bible believing <laughs> believers. We've got to make sure that we look different because if we don't look any different from the culture, if we don't act any different from the culture, if we don't <clears throat> shift the way we think and start doing the things that God has called us to do, we're not going to make it very far in this time. We're not going to make it very far in the culture. We're not going to last. We're not running our race, as Paul would say. 
to win. Now, I want to take a look over 2 Kings 9 for just a few minutes. And I want to talk to you about the answer. What is the answer for the spirit of Jezebel? What is the answer for the spirit of Jezebel? Well, in 2 Kings 9, it says, it tells us that Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, get yourself ready, take the flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramath Gilead. Now, here's something I want you to note. And I didn't, I didn't touch on this over in uh, Revelation chapter 2, and I wanted to real quick. And so let me just go back and hit that real quick. That It says that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. Now, in the Old Testament, Jezebel was a prophet or a prophetess of the god Baal, which it was a fertility god and did child sacrifice and all of this fun stuff, right? Not fun. Very bad stuff. So... <clears throat> A counter prophetic movement was answered by a prophetic movement. You see, the answer for the the answer for the the culture, the answer for everything going on in the world, the answer is one Jesus. But it's also a prophetic movement, a prophetic voice of people who are willing to stand up and say thus saith the lord and it not and and the thing we have to understand about prophecy is prophecy and and saying thus saith the lord is we can just say thus saith the lord and use our scripture and use our bible because all prophecy is is speaking the word of god about the future and we can declare it and we can declare those things that are not to be as though they are so I want you so we've got to get very comfortable with prophecy. We've got to get very comfortable again because and that's one of the things if you've noticed over the last couple of years that all of the prophets were discredited. Whenever it came to 2020, it came the 2020 election and it came to Trump and everybody said Trump's going to win, Trump's going to win, Trump's going to win and then Trump didn't win. All of the prophets now are discredited. And <clears throat> All of these prophets are just going in and everybody's writing them off and nobody's wanting to listen to the prophetic. And we have to be careful. Now, there are there are a lot of those that stood up and said, hey, we were wrong. We blew it. We're sorry. We messed up. And there are those that didn't. And, and I think we have to be very careful about the voices that we are allowing to speak into us, the voices that we are allowing to um, the, 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 the prophetic voices, because the thing about the prophetic voice is everybody and their brother wants to be a prophet. Everybody in their, you know, they, they get a business card and they say, Oh, Hey brother, I am, I'm prophet. So-and-so, and and I want to come speak at your church or, Hey, let me give you a prophetic word. And we've got to be very, very, very careful about that. And actually when we talk about prophecy, the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that, um, in that speaking of prophecy, in that, all of that, that all prophecy is to be judged according to scripture and according to the hearing of the believers. And so we have to make sure that when we talk about a prophetic movement, we're talking about a prophetic movement that is under authority, not a prophetic, not a bunch of lawless prophets running around and making a mess and coming in and prophesying this and prophesying that. And, but no, a, a bunch of people, a group of prophets that are under apostolic authority that are moving in the actual giftings of God and not just in there. I want to show, and I want to make a whole lot of money because here's the problem with, here's the problem with a lot of the prophetic and is that it is, in my experience, it is either turned into a show or it has turned into a money grab. And most of these, and, and let me be careful here. Some of these so-called prophets in the church 
are nothing more than diviners and and people who have no um, discernible prayer life. They have no discernible scripture life. They have no discernible um, relationship with God, yet they feel the authority to speak on his behalf. Now, do you understand how I can how how I feel that that is just a little bit not right? And so we have to be very, very careful when we when it comes to prophecy, when it comes to prophets, when it comes to who we let speak into our lives. We have to be very, very, very careful. And if these people are not willing to submit to authority, if these people are not willing to be challenged on the authentic on, on the authentic authenticity of the prophetic word or their prophetic gifting if they are not if they are not humble enough to um admit that hey i was in the flesh and i missed this and i misinterpreted what god was trying to tell me here then we need to run 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 away from those kinds of people because the, the bible talks about people that operated it the bible talks about people that operate in lawlessness and he says this he says many on that day will say lord lord did we not prophesy in your name did we not cast out devils in your name did we not perform many signs and wonders in your name and he will say depart from me for i never knew you you were of iniquity or that workers of iniquity could also be that workers of iniquity could also be is, is translated in other versions as you lawless ones, meaning they did it without authorization. They they weren't really listening to the Holy Spirit. They were listening to a spirit, but they were not listening to the Holy Spirit. And so we as a group and body of believers have to be very careful as to who we let speak into our lives. And we have to make sure that they are under authority. They are submitted to that authority. They are not rebelling. They are not living in lawlessness. They are doing exactly everything that the Bible prescribes for leaders and prophets and apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and all of the, the, the fivefold ministry gifts plus all the spiritual giftings. Everything has to fall under authority and we've got to make sure that we are falling under that authority and that we are not becoming lawless and we are not becoming out of sync with what God has for us. Because if we do become out of sync with what God has for us, then we are coming into agreement with the enemy and we are not coming into agreement with what God has for us in our own lives. Man, I did not intend to go that far. I didn't intend to go. Well, I didn't intend to go there at all, but that's good stuff. We've got to remember We've got to keep in mind all of this stuff because the days are waxing worse and worse. So Elisha the prophet, let's go back. Second Kings nine, verse one. And Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophet and said, get yourself ready. Take the flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now, when you arrive at that place, look for, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him rise up from among his associates and take him to an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and do not delay. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he arrived, there were the captains of the army sitting and he said, I have a message for you, commander. Jehu said, for which one of us? And he said, for you, commander. Then he arose, went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head and said to him, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord over Israel. You shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. Because Jezebel is coming after the prophetic, and she killed many prophets. And it, and it says that in in a different in a different verse here that there were people who hid the prophets in caves because Jezebel was so adamant against the a, a true, authentic prophetic move 
of God. And so we have to remember, we have to make sure no that the spirit of Jezebel is always against an authentic prophetic movement. Okay. Verse number eight, it says, For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off Ahab from all the males in Israel, both, both bond and free. So I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahai. Ahijah, the dog shall eat Jezebel on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. He did exactly what his boss told him to do. He got up and he ran. Now, here's what I want you to look at. In verse number eight, it says that the whole house of Ahab shall perish. Now, in what environment can the spirit of Jezebel flourish? You see, the spirit of Jezebel can flourish in, it flourishes in an environment that has no authority. Because if you, if you look at Ahab, you look at everything that he was and everything that he did, he was a man that was, uh, he was a very weak leader. And in fact, um, it, we can see through scripture that it was his wife, Jezebel, that manipulated things behind him. One particular story that comes to mind is when he is talking, he, a, Ahab is trying to gain a wine press and a vineyard. And the owner of the vineyard tells him, no, I'm not going to sell it. This is my inheritance. You know, you, you basically, you can't make me under the law. This is nothing's going to, you can't do this. And so what Jezebel does is Jezebel goes, kills him, kills the owner behind the king's back, takes the land and gives that vineyard to Ahab. So Jezebel is a manipulate is a very manipulative type of type of person. She is a very backhanded in the, background behind the scenes kind of person and so it Jezebel cannot operate where there is legitimate authority present that is why she was out against the legitimate authority of the prophets she was against all of these different people why because they they represented a threat to her so when we're when we're operating in an authentic prophetic movement when we're operating in an in an authentic apostolic prophetic movement the enemy the spirit of Jezebel cannot operate or cannot operate freely because she is constantly challenged. That manipulation is constantly challenged. And we have to make sure as believers that one, we we are challenging manipulation in our own lives and we're making sure that we make sure that we are not being uh, deceived or misled. So Jezebel flourishes under weak leadership. Okay. Now let's talk about, I got just a couple, I got, I got about 10 minutes left before we, before we end this, this evening. And maybe I won't, maybe I won't tell, go that just far and maybe we'll save the full story for next week. Because I'm telling you, the, the 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 answer for what's happening around us, the answer for the Jezebel spirit, is a Jehu generation. Now, who was Jehu? Let's talk about Jehu for just a second. Jehu was identified as a crazy man. He was a man that was he he was a man of war. He was a man who was, he was not afraid to do battle. He was not afraid to lock horns. He was, you know, as we would describe him, he would be, he was a man's man. He was, he was, he was a leader. There, there's a, there's a story in, uh, 
in Second Kings here where it talks about they know Jehu's coming because of the way he's driving. They describe and say, it's Jehu's coming because he's driving like a crazy man. And so he, he, he does everything. He is big and he is intense. And after Jezebel, and he, he starts just, the prophet comes and anoints him king. His compatriots recognize him as king. They throw their coats on the ground. They and and which becomes a which becomes a, a Jewish celebration of of this is the king. Which you know we could totally go into um, the people throwing their coats on the ground as Jesus is walking into uh, Jerusalem. But we're not going to do that. You can, that's a cool little thing you can uh, look at on your own. So, anyways. The answer for the the lawlessness of Jezebel was a man that didn't care about the consequences of what he was doing. He was a he was a crazy man. He was somebody that was willing to stand and stand at the word of the Lord and say, "Thus saith the Lord," and this is I now I have the anointing, I have the authorization, and now I am going to go come hell or high water, come it, it, no matter what stands against me, no matter what obstacle comes in my way, I'm just going to barrel through it. I'm going to completely press the enemy. I'm going to push, I'm going to push, and I'm going to push until we until he saw the enemy fall, until he saw Jezebel come to the ground. And in fact, it was, it was Jehu in to the city where they were, where, where, where Jezebel was living. And he, in verse 32 of Second uh, Kings 9 here, it says that as Jehu entered the gate, she's, as Jehu entered the gate, she said, is it peace, is it me, murderer of your master? This is Jezebel. He's, he's talking to. And he looked up at the window and said to her, who is on my side? Who? So two or three eunuchs looked out at him. Then he said, throw her down. So they threw her down and some of her blood spattered on the wall and the horses traveled her underfoot. And when he had gone in, he ate and drank. And then he said, go see to this accursed woman and bury her for she was a king's daughter. So they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet of her palms in her hands. Therefore, they came back and told him. And he said, this is the word. This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant, Elijah, the Tishbite, saying on this plot, on the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel and the corpse of Jezebel shall be refuse on the surface of the field in the plot of Jezreel so that they shall not say here lies Jezebel. <coughs> Excuse me. He looks at those that are surrounding her. And he says to them, throw her down. And they do. Throwing of Jezebel comes from an authentic prophetic movement. It comes from people being under authority and hearing the word of the Lord. And it comes from, lastly, the people who have been deceived, hurt, rejected, beat down, and abused by that deceptive, lying spirit, casting her out. Yes, I said casting her out. And watching her fall repenting and turning back to God. You see, I believe that God is raising up a Jehu generation, a generation of believers who can hear the word of the Lord, will act upon the word of the Lord, and will cast out and will cause others to cast out the lying, 
devil, that lying spirit, and it can't, it can be more than Jezebel. But I am, I believe that what this world needs, and I believe that what God is raising up right now in our midst is a generation of people who are, and when I say a generation of people, I don't just mean a young person. I don't just mean an old person. I mean, anybody that is alive currently that is ready to say, ready to stand up and say, you know what? I've had enough of this. I'm going to take a stand. I'm going to wait and I'm going to hear the voice of the Lord. And when I hear the word of the Lord, I am going to on the word of the Lord, knowing that he has anointed me. He has authorized me to move into everything that God has called everything that he has for me. And so with that, I bless you. I love you. And I pray right now, that we would be a Jehu generation that would rise up and take a stand for righteousness in Jesus' name. God bless you. We'll see you next week, next Tuesday, 7 p.m. right here. And we're going to pray that these internet issues start getting better in Jesus' name. God bless you all. We'll talk to you later.